Hey, super friends, if you're listening to this podcast, I have a feeling that you might also enjoy my prose book. Yes, I released a prose book. It is called Super Soldiers, a salute to the comic book heroes and villains that served. And it is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and your local bookstore right now. So head on over there, order it right now. It is my personal look into the military comic book superheroes and villains that have served. You can buy it anywhere. And if you've buy it, bought it already, thank you so much. Please head on over to Amazon and Goodreads and leave a review. It makes a big difference with people discovering the book. And I hope you enjoyed it. Now on to the show. The Midnighter is the most dangerous man on the planet, able to plan a fight a million moves ahead, capable of killing ruthlessly, relentlessly, and without remorse. And now, the GHO Book Club on Midnighter is now in session. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason the Nooner Inman. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your Mind University because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we take one character, construct, or team from popular culture and teach you everything you need to know about them in about an hour. Uh, except today where we're doing a book club episode. That's right. And uh, I'm going to explain just the case your face went just like Ashley's did when I said Jason the Nooner Inman. It was my attempt to do the opposite of the Midnighter. Ah. The Nooner the Midnighter. Uh, Get you, bring your heads out of the gutter yeah, there. Yeah, that's what I thought you were. Uh, this is to. a family-friendly podcast. Not a family-friendly character necessarily, though. This is this this character is nowhere near. If you let your kids read this book, shame on you. Uh, I don't know if maybe the la- uh, maybe one of our book clubs so far has been good for kids. Ashley, um, what is the GHL book club? Have we ever explained this? Yes. Let's, Every let's, episode. Let's do it again. Uh, the book club is where approximately once a month, depending on scheduling, of course, we decide to do a deep dive on a book. We try to make it topical to what's going on in the oldie world or pick something that we think is really integral and really, really important. And because Pride Month just happened, we thought we would do a queer character and Midnighter was my first suggestion. That is correct. And this is the Midnighter, the uh Complete. What is the official title of this thing? I don't Midnight or colon the complete Wildstorm series. Wow. Uh, this is a 500 page collection. How do, you, how do you have that off the top of your head already? Because I've written every single Patreon post about it and every single social media post about it. That's why. <laughs> um, I'm trying to still open the book on my iPad. It's not working. That's okay. Well, because it's a huge book. Because uh, unfortunately, the thing about Midnighter is yes. they don't collect Midnighter's um, trades uh, kind of until. Um, the the DC Rebirth era mm-hmm. uh, stuff. So we actually are going to focus primarily on the first 120 pages of this, which is the quote unquote the Hitler story. Yes. But this is the only collection that publishes it. So you got to get the whole big thing, uh, which is why we offer digital and hard mm-hmm. copy, of course. Um, this is the only place that uh, Midnighter solo stuff is collected. Well, uh, that's not technically correct because there has been another Midnighter solo series, and that is not part of this. That has not been collected. And there's, I don't uh, think it's in print right now, though. No, I don't think it is either. This is this is actually a collection that DC put together like a couple years ago. Yeah. Uh, but uh, very famous creators have worked on this character, and this character has made a mark on pop culture. I guess maybe we should explain. Who the hell Midnighter is? Because some people might be like, hey, I I don't know who this Midnighter character is. And I've read a lot of DC comic books. How do I not know who he is? Now, actually, should I take a stab at this or should you? Because I'm a big Wildstorm guy and Midnighter is a Wildstorm guy. Uh, Sure. I I can give you, I think I can give you a good 10 cent version of it, but you can probably actually give some publication history. Let's go. 10 cents origin. Let's go. Let's see see if you can do it. What if Batman and Superman were gay? That's Midnighter and Apollo. That's true. But who's Apollo? (laughs) I've never heard of this Apollo guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Well, if you haven't read the recent Grayson series... There's uh, uh, Midnighter kind of had a big sabbatical before DC eight Wildstorm. Mm-hmm. So not no, not really. Uh, it, Midnighter, I think you're getting your timelines all confused. Midnighter had a sabbatical recently when DC eight Wildstorm actually is when this series happened. Um, actually, this series actually I think is being published 
when DC buys Wildstorm. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't think that I, Or I think this happens after DC buys Wildstorm. But no, basically what I'm looking for is, what I, it has, because we might be saying Midnighter here, and everybody's, again, the question is, who the hell is Midnighter? You're very correct on there. Um, there are some characters that are called The Authority, and they were introduced in a series, a Wildstorm series, which was an originally a imprint of Image Comics. Actually, what's Image Comics? The largest and most powerful independent publisher of comics. Well, yeah, uh, uh, you know, this, they're the famous artists that ran away from Marvel and DC. Todd McFarlane, Mark Silvestri, Eric Larson, Jim Lee, who now works for DC. Jim Lee, Wildstorm was Jim Lee's company. He published a title called Stormwatch. It was written by, at the time, Warren Ellis and uh, drawn by Brian Hitch. And they introduced a couple of characters in there. Authority, they were called the Authority. And two of those characters are Apollo and Midnighter. Uh, basically, the Authority is... Images version of the Justice League. They really are. But they're a Justice League that goes too far. They're just like that becomes bloody. They're a Justice League that doesn't believe in borders. They're just like that believes in changing the world. And Midnighter is their Batman character. And of course, he is in a homosexual relationship with Apollo, who is the Superman character. And uh, you later learn on that they're being experimented on and blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah, blah. Uh, but Midnighter basically has a Batman esque costume. Mm-hmm. He wears a trench coat and he has a moon on his chest. So that's who Midnighter is, in case you've never, never heard him. And if you haven't read Midnighter or The Authority, whew, you need to be you need to be reading. And he has like low key precognitive abilities. Yeah, I, I was going to explain who all of his powers here okay. in a second. Uh, his Tencent origin is that he, of course, is published by DC Comics and Wildstorm. He's been written. Uh, this series has been written by Garth Ennis, Keith Given, Brian K. Vaughn. And the main art in the series is Chris Sprouse. Now, Midnighter's powers specifically before we get into the story are. Are superhuman strength, speed, reflexes, and resilience. The character is also shown to be moving faster than both the human and the superhuman eye and possesses a healing factor that is at Wolverine mm-hmm. levels. In one storyline, it was portrayed that he was able to beat the AIDS virus in six weeks. Um, he also has a trademark ability to be able to predict a million moves of a battle. Mm-hmm. So he can predict like what you're going to do before you can do it. It's not really said to be precognition. It's just said that he is like brain is so much like a computer. Mm-hmm. He's so tactical that he can figure out what you're going to do before you do it. But it is portrayed as being similar to precognitive because he for all intents, just to like sort of dumb it down. He knows what you're going to do before you're going to do it. But that's because he's extrapolated. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's because his brain has done that many. Cal- it's not because he's psychic. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. Probably the best example is it's very similar, and they've shown this in the comic books before. It's very similar to in the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes film. Remember mm-hmm. how that movie begins with a fist fight, and you see Sherlock like go through all the moves, mm-hmm. and then Sherlock does it. That's kind of the way it's portrayed. Yeah, that he can like do all that stuff, which is also a trait that in some storylines is um, attributed to Batman. Yes. Now, this collection includes the entire Midnighter Wildstorm solo series, and 1 through 20 and Midnighter Armageddon. Again, we're mainly going to focus on the first six, and the synopsis is fed up with his teammates in the authority, including his husband Apollo, and their lost mission of saving the world from itself, Midnighter strikes out on his own, despite possessing superhuman abilities to make To see every move his opponents will make, Midnighter can't see what's ahead for himself. So he's blackmailed into assassinating Hitler before the start of World War II. He's given a chance to find out about his past before he became a superhuman killing machine. And he's hunted by an assassin with unlimited means. Okay. So let's talk about the book, Ashley. Mm -hmm. Uh, How much of the authority have you read before this book? None. So this is your first uh, exposure to the authority. I mean, very brief not as it is. Really, like they're mentioned in a bunch of other stuff. I've read a lot of other uh, Midnighter stories. Midnighter is a big part, not a big part, but he's featured in the Grayson miniseries. Yeah, I'd say he's a very minor part of that. Um, and then I read. I think he's in like three issues of the whole twenty-five issue series. I really, I thought he was in much more than that. No, he's not in that much of it. Um, and then I read um, a good chunk of the Midnighter and Apollo series. The solo series. Yeah. Or team That's a series. lie. Okay, I read the first volume of The Authority. So the one written by Warren But Ellis. I read it at the same time that I read the first volume of Planetary, and I'm going to be honest, I don't really know which one is which, and I don't remember liking either of them. Uh, I'm going to say it right now. I'm going to throw down the <laughs> hot take. Planetary is much better. I don't know. One of them has a stupid guy in it with white hair whose last name is Snow. That's like... That's Planetary. Truly the 
only thing I remember about both of yep, them. There's nobody named Snow in The Authority. Um, so, yeah, I read this. And it's funny because the Hitler arc starts with a dude with white hair with like a mysterious. And I was like, oh, is that that Snow guy? And it's not. So let's talk about the first issue of this. So you get to briefly see the check in with the Authority mm-hmm. in here. You get to see their spaceship that can cross the bleed. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you get a giant scene where um, Midnighter kicks a giant 50 cal bullet. And fights a tank battalion. Yeah. What do you think about this? This is the first issue. Um, I like this first issue a lot because it feels like they are exploring an idea that comics and genre always wants to deal with, but nobody ever says, yeah, let's kill Hitler. Mm -hmm. And I like that you know right off the bat that Midnighter is a real badass. And you also know that he's smart. I think it's a really good, I think it's a good introduction to the character. I don't think it's a good introduction to, like, the world of the authority. Well, this is very different from authority stories because this is the first solo series to be spun out. Uh, Which is fair, but I mean, they're doing, like, they do in this this collection, they do stuff with the doors. Yes. And he does reference, like, some of their tech and some of their supporting players. And it's treated like, well, if you're reading this, you know. And I was like, I don't. I don't know what the door thing is. Well, the door thing is, is so basically the authority exists on the ship. I forget the name of it, but the ship is sentient uh-huh. and alive and it is a ship designed to travel the multiverse. Yeah. Now, this ship is so advanced that it has alien technology because it's so futuristic technology in it uh-huh. that if you it's kind of like the rainbow bridge. If you say door mm-hmm. and the ship likes you. Yeah. It will open up a door for you. To wherever you want to go. And it can instantaneously take you anywhere because it travels you through Mm -hmm. the bleed of the multiverse, the membrane between the multiverse. And that's why that's how you're able to go anywhere immediately. I also appreciate the fact that they're in no way trying to humanize Hitler. They're just like, he's a piece of garbage. He deserves. Well, let's wait on Hitler because that's like (laughs) several issues down the road. Let's talk about the first issue that is specifically about it's the whole first issue is literally Midnighter fighting this army in the desert in Afghanistan. I don't I don't know if they ever say where it is. He's literally fighting an army. It's great. You know, in in the thing. It has nothing to do with Hitler. It has nothing to do. It is is this guy. Sorry, Sorry for jumping ahead. Taking down five takes in Afghanistan. It seems like it's Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's very brutal. And it's and and it's very I just want to ask you because the authority is full of attitude. And first off, this is this story is very different from the authority. This story, I I'm going to say, is very similar to a Wolverine story. Mm. This is a Wolverine story like this is not. This is not how an authority story reads. An authority story is way more cerebral than this. Um, and also an authority story is generally trying to make a point about something Mm -hmm. and they just use these characters as analog. Most of the authority stories are, uh, the current, you know, the current, uh, world government suck. So the authority is here to change it. Um, the Avengers are actually a terrible team. So the authority is here to change it. I mean, I will say given, given particularly the writer, um, there, there's nothing about this that I find surprising. This is exactly what I expect. Well, this is Garth Ennis, yeah, the creator like, of Preacher. In my opinion, like Garth Ennis stories are mean and sometimes mean without a point, and like that's definitely what this is. I'm gonna say, is it cool? Sure. I'm gonna say, uh, well, that's what I want to talk about because there is a panel in this first issue where he beats the crap out of this dude, and the guy holds up his finger, his middle finger, but his middle finger is blown off. Yeah. And Midnighter says, "Think you're gonna have to speak up now." This is one very Garth Ennis line. This mm-hmm. is full of Garth Ennis lines. But this is also a very author. This is a very Midnighter line. This moment full of, uh, um, I'm excuse my language, frack use mm-hmm. as a, you know best as they would say in mm-hmm. Brass for Galactica that we can get past the censors on that one. Mm-hmm. But that is what the authority is full of. You generally don't respond to these type of stories. So is this being the first issue, this being the first introduction, you're reading the story about this guy that is kind of an ass Mm -hmm. beating up these American soldiers. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy it? I mean, I, I guess so. I don't remember not enjoying it. So I guess I did. Um, I think I give Midnighter a little bit of a pass because he is um, a gay character and I appreciate that they're making him like, he is like Wolverine. Like he's very like mask. He's very aggressive. And I think, 
because I can understand where that meanness would come from, to me, I don't feel like it's mean for no reason. Mm -hmm. Um, And he does in later issues, um, people get real mean to him. So I don't know. I mean, I guess I didn't have an issue with with it because I didn't make any, I don't don't remember it sticking with me as like, wow, this is weird and mean. Like Midnighter is mean. Mm hmm. Um, even in the later incarnations, like I think in the more contemporary stuff, he's softened a lot compared to here. And I would also assume compared to the way he acts in the authority, but I don't know. I I guess I liked it. (laughs) Well, we get into the second issue where we find out that this whole, this whole complex is this gentleman whose name that I cannot remember, uh, who was in the camps at Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. He is there to basically conscript Midnighter into killing Hitler and there's a very nice scene where they walk through a rose garden Ashley what are your thoughts about that scene it's interesting because in a uh, we are now in a post Hunger Games world and that scene is almost exactly lifted into a scene in the Hunger Games where President Snow speaking of guys named Snow is walking through his white rose garden and talking to Katniss so that was the first thing that I thought and then I spent a while trying to figure out who this pseudo Magneto guy was supposed to be um, and it turns out he's just a character who's created for the he only exists for in, this storyline story. yeah like he's not an overarching character like I said I'm trying to find his name real quick it's okay I think they only mentioned it once or twice um, what I think is interesting about this character is that he is is asking Midnighter and thereby the audience to engage in Paulus. The, there you go he is asking Midnighter thereby the audience to engage in the thought experiment like well, would you go back and kill Hitler? And I like the fact, and I think it only works because it is coming from uh, Garth Ennis, who is a meaner writer with a character with a meaner point of view, that uh, we're opening the door here and we're going to say, yeah. And But I think setting it in a garden, which is peaceful and which is beautiful, uh, is a really, it's a smart It's a smart way because we started with a bunch of carnage and we're Mm -hmm. about to get into even more carnage. But we have this sort of reprieve with this scene. We also have to talk about uh, the idea that Midnighter gets sent back to War One. And I like the idea that Midnighter says, I am going to kill you all. I'm going to kill you all. And then Midnighter finds Adolf Hitler in the trenches of War One and kicks him so hard in the balls. uh, Pardon my French. That. Adolf complains about it for almost three pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a recurring gag. It's also a very, uh, it is a very Midnighter uh, kind of thing. Uh, I guess, you know, we didn't do a spoiler warning, but I don't care. Um, I think the spoiler warnings are sort of foregone when you're doing a book club. Like, we're going to analyze this book. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because I can remember when I read this for the first time, because I read this storyline before we did this book review, um, that I did not see the twist coming when Adolf freezes and the time police show up and mm-hmm. try to arrest Midnighter. I did not notice that at all. Um, I also think that it's interesting idea to to juxtapose Midnighter into the situation like you talked about like killing what if you went back in time mm-hmm. and killed Hitler before he performed the atrocities with a character that is sort of the ultimate rule breaker mm-hmm. like you know because this is one of those things where you'd be like oh this is the one rule you shouldn't break and we're going to put the character that breaks all the rules into this situation I uh, I love all of the time police I love they just seem like very tired officials trying to do their job yes they try to arrest them <laughs> under the crime of temporal realignment is the simply uh, which is messing with the timeline yes it's just simply the uh, you know uh, and I assume the, all their uh, police department uniforms like I said they're dressed just like modern day police yeah, yeah, yeah. and their vests say TPD uh, which I assume is the temporal police department um, I I do too I like I didn't see the time police coming mm-hmm um, um, I guess I should have. Did you see this twist coming at all? Well, I knew about the time police because um, I kn- there's a scene that's coming later on that Jason has talked about many times on the podcast. Uh, you had told me about this storyline before, so I knew the time police were coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we'll get to that storyline. So basically, he, he we basically recreate episode one mm-hmm. or issue one, excuse me, not the Phantom Menace, where Midnighter fights the time police uh, and Bonnie, the redheaded time police Love Bonnie. sergeant is in charge and she uh, um, she tra- don't take no guff. She doesn't take no guff and she launches a missile up uh, Midnighter's Wahoo and uh, it leads to her capturing Midnighter. Let's talk about Bonnie. 
Bonnie's the best. Bonnie is like, she's equal parts like your third grade teacher and also like your mean crossing guard. And I love that she gets to be hard on Midnighter here without being hateful because there are a lot of people who uh, hate Midnighter for various reasons and his homosexuality being one of the more prevalent ones. And I think because we're pitting him in one part against one of the most awful people, the biggest villains in human history, it's nice that even though Bonnie is presented as an obstacle, um, because she is drawn like a middle-aged woman, she doesn't seem like a bad guy. Like, you never hate Bonnie. You're always like kind of on Bonnie's side, but you also kind of want Midnighter to kill Hitler because why wouldn't you want that to happen? Of course. And then he mucks around with the stuff. He escapes from the handcuffs. And I he, love it when he breaks out of the and, the time shift. And he crashes the time shift, time shift, excuse me, in April of 1945, which means the Russians and the Americans are coming to Berlin. It's so, this He's, scene is so upsetting. I, I actually like it because um, it means that it immediately puts a ticking clock on to the story mm-hmm. where he Eliza has so many times to kill Hitler and then he meets the children Nazi brigade. <laughs> well, the the <laughs> Hit- Hitler Jungen were were a very real thing. The Hitler Youth Army is that what yeah. they're called? Yeah. Um and and it's very and this is a very Garth Ennis like this is a real thing that actually happened that's deeply upsetting and he's not going to let us forget it like he's going to use it mm-hmm. for the purpose of this and like watching Midnighter try to deal with these Nazi children is equal parts tragic and hilarious like he's like fine fine whatever just go away but the brilliant piece <laughs> of writing in this and this is a moment that I really enjoyed is that the children. Because Midnighter is dressed in leather mm-hmm. and he has a trench coat mm-hmm. and he has a trench vest. They think he's the SS. Yeah. They think he's an SS officer because by their standards, they don't know what superheroes are. No. What else would he be? Yeah. Which I think is really, and especially the thing of like, they're like, are you going to meet the Fuhrer? Can we come along, please? Yeah. <laughs> no. I also love that when he does get, uh, I guess, to the bunker. It's just a disaster. <laughs> like, like it's the epitome of like everything is falling apart and we're all gonna die. And then there, I think there's one point where he's walking through the hall with all the drunk men, and uh, he looks at one guy and he's like, "Hey, you're gonna die anyway, right?" And then just punches him through the face. Mm-hmm. And then he arrives at the famous bunker. Yes. Um, there's a very excellent Anthony Hopkins movie, by the way, that is about the final days in the bunker. I can't remember what it's called. It was a TV movie. Go Google it. It's amazing. Anthony Hopkins as Adolf Hitler. It's quite it's quite an astounding performance. Uh, but he walks into this bunker. All the German soldiers are just partying, uh, uh, you know, ha- making shenanigans. And they, again, think he is an SS officer. Yeah, no one really questions why he's there. Mm-hmm. Even and though uh, it would SS be the officers most... did not wear full masks. Well, also at this point, like that bunker would be the most heavily fortified place in Berlin, mm. you know, dead stop. And he kills this one dude who sees him and tells him where everybody is. And he literally obliterates the man's face in the casual, yep. very bloody eyeball popping out. This this is authority. Authority is bloody as hell. Mm. Um, I want to say it's a Mark Miller panel, but, you know, Warren Ellis started first. And he says the line, I can only walk past so many Nazis. Yes. Which is a very interesting. Which thing. is a good line. Um, so he finally meets Hitler. Hitler is a very old man. Hitler looks terrible. Hitler looks stressed. He's pathetic. Yep. He's a pathetic, ugly, fat old man. Mm-hmm. And he sees Midnighter. And there's a brief. This is a great moment. It's a single page. There's only two lines on this page. And Hitler notices Midnighter and says, do I know you from somewhere? Mm-hmm. And Midnighter says, no. And Midnighter lets Hitler walk past him. He does not kill Hitler. Ashley, let's talk about this. Midnighter doesn't do it. Midnighter lets the timeline happen. Although I would say that Midnighter could have killed Hitler in this bunker and no one would have been the wiser. What are your thoughts about that Midnighter does not kill Hitler in the storyline? Well, you can't muck. That's a pretty important piece of uh, human history, and apparently they didn't want to commit to changing that in the DC universe too completely. Quentin Tarantino has no regards. Uh, You know what? You don't have to be like Quentin Tarantino. I think that's a perfectly good way to live your life. Um, It's... It's interesting because Midnighter is not a character prone to soft moments, 
and to give him this moment of humanity. It's one of the rare ones that we get. There is another one off that comes right after this. That's about a shogun. That's actually a pretty soft version of Midnighter. And it's not that this is a soft moment and it's not like he's granting Hitler some great mercy. I'm sure dying by a cyanide pill is pretty awful. Um, But it shows that Midnighter in his core of cores is a good dude Mm -hmm. buried under all that leather and all that hatred. So I kind of love it. And I find I'm I'm I find it unexpected for, for a Warren Ellis story. Uh, Garth Ennis. Sorry, Garth Ennis. Garth Ennis story. Warren Ellis only created this character. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and um, look, they got to have similar last names. What the heck, Well, guys? Ennis Ellis. Yeah, I know, I know, but that's, I can flee them. Sorry. Uh, so we get to the next issue. Uh, Midnighter uh, basically has a very nice scene with Bonnie where he explains why he didn't kill that Hitler guy. Mm-hmm. And there's a very nice scene where Herr Paulus gets a visit from Alfred Wolfram, formerly of the uh, Groschen Deutschland Excuse me, I'm badly butchering that. And uh, this gentleman shows up to Paulus and says, I have a message from you from a man so great. in a black long coat with a symbol on his chest like a sickle moon. And he says, the only message I was supposed to deliver is, I am coming. Which I was like, that is such a great way to... There's a lot of little moments in this. That, again, I think this is the reason why... I, I, I'm going to just say, like, I like this initial story. Mm-hmm. Because there, there, there are little moments of just like, ah, oh, that's great. That's really good. Um, and this is one of them. Thoughts on the book, Ashley? Oh, <laughs> are we are we are we finished the whole book now? <laughs> no, I mean no. Thoughts on this seed? I mean the whole idea of having a book club is a discussion here. Yeah, um, I think it's a I, th- I think it's a nice scene. I think it's a clever it's a clever way to play with the time travel aspect without just having midnight or break through yet another window or kick down another door. Um, it's another sort of you know talking about soft moments. And I like the use of this character, even though this character um, is not someone who we see in the past in sort of the World War II storyline. Yeah, we didn't need it. We, we don't need it. No, 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 no. But I mean, in a different story, perhaps if this were a Batman story, for example, uh, we would have met this character and he would have had a meaningful interaction with the superhero. And then we would have seen him uh, travel forward through time until this very moment. But it's a it's a very subtle way to lay down a threat. Yes. And now we get to the moment where Midnighter is coming back to the future. Back to the future, Marty! With the time police, and we get the moment that I have talked about on GHL for a very, very, Mm -hmm. very long time. Ashley, do you want to talk about it here? Sure. (laughs) So they're in the time ship, and they have a lot of time to kill, I guess. And so Bonnie looks over at Midnighter, and uh, they're buddies now. She's not calling by his nickname anymore. Things are going okay. And she's like, hey, do you want to, you know, cover your children's ears if you're for some reason letting them listen to this? Um, she says, hey, do you, you want to go back there and have sex? And Midnighter's like, no, thank you. Like, I'm gay. That's not my preference. And I'm married. And I'm married. Um, and Bonnie explains to him that in the future where she comes from, that everyone is everything and labels don't matter. And that's OK. And then. She cites an example of some people on the ship, but then we pull out to a panel where you just see the ship kind of traveling through space. And I think he says, uh, take that b- a Bible belt. Well, I think he says, like, oh, you, you all like, are caring about the wrong yeah, thing. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. It's like it all doesn't and matter. And he's laughing maniacally. And, and I, you've talked about this moment for so long, so I knew it was coming. But I love this moment because even if Midnighter were not a queer character... We're at the end of a story about Nazis and at the end of that moral quandary of do you kill Hitler in in the future, in the future from both the reader and from Adolf Hitler existing. Everyone's accepted mm-hmm. and everything is OK. And, that- and they're quite a ways in the future. I, th- I want to say they don't they are they from like a tw- I could be wrong about this. Yeah. Are they for like the 29th century or yeah, something they're, like that? They're, they're, way they're a ways the away in the future. But it doesn't matter because yeah. everything still winds up being okay and everyone still winds up being accepted. It's truly the nicest version of like we're putting a bow and a rainbow mm-hmm. on this that you could get. The story that we spent with Nazis. For this story, yeah, that opens, I, has several sequences of Midnighter fighting tanks. I like the idea that in this story... They pr- propose the idea that love is love. I yeah, love that yeah. idea. And then, and then in the future, it's like, look, it doesn't matter who you love. You can love a tree, you can love a car, it doesn't love whatever, whatever. Yeah, you know, it's 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 truly that idea. Like, are you hurting no anyone? No. Who cares? Go for yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. It's real. And, and, and for a tough, 
harsh son of a bitch character yeah, yeah. like Midnighter. It's an interesting point to make. It's this very it's a very soft kind yeah. of ending. And then of course, you know, you have to because again, Garth Ennis, not Warren Ellis, and again because Midnighter, he does have to make a snide remark about it at the end, which I which I love and I think is really, really funny. We'll share the panel on social media because we've talked about it, we've lauded it for so long on the podcast. Yes. So then we get to how Midnighter gets out of this situation because he had a bomb implanted in his chest, all of the Suicide mm-hmm. Squad, and that's how Paulus made him do his dirty work. And Midnighter shows up with young Paulus, six-year-old Paulus, and his hand around his head and is like, if you blow up the bomb in my chest, I guarantee you my, my reflexes are better than yours. We have superhuman reflexes. Mm-hmm. I will crush your skull and you won't exist. So I'm going to stay awake during the entire surgery <laughs> yeah. holding this little boy's skull in my hand and don't you try anything. Um, because we can't have a totally altruistic ending. No, yet. no, no. Well, this is, this, this, is the, poor, this poor baby this child. A, yeah. What did you think about Midnighter's solution to getting out of the bomb? Very clever. Um, also kind of, a, you know, it's kind of upsetting. Like, it's also back to that argument, like, would you kill baby Hitler? Like, this six-year-old child, this is an innocent boy who's just asleep. And, you know, Midnighter is threatening a child who, granted, grows up to be a, a giant, awful person. It's also just a shorthand to show you, again, what a badass. Like, yeah, we saw him fight tanks. And, yeah, we saw him kick Hitler in the nuts and all that's great. But, like... He's going to stay awake throughout the entire surgery. And I don't care how good your healing factor is. That's a horrifying thing to choose Mm -hmm. to do. It's sort of reminding us that who Midnighter is and maybe he didn't have to learn a lot. Like he didn't learn a lesson from doing this. And he's not the person who was designed to learn a lesson narratively. It was all the players surrounding him. Yeah. Um, I kind of love it. I think it's a genius move. I'm going to say what I think is the genius move is the reveal. So Midnighter burns down Paulus's house at the end. Mm. And you find out that Paulus is not even Jewish. Nope. His father was like sort of a sympathizer and said something bad about Adolf Hitler. And that's the reason why they got sent to the camps. And Midnighter says like he took a little digging around and he figured out that Paulus's dad was just as despicable as Adolf Hitler. And he probably would have been Adolf Hitler if he'd killed Hitler. So he's like, oh, I think the reason why you wanted me to kill Hitler was that so that your family would have had a better standing. And you would have been the heir apparent. And you would have yes. been the heir apparent, which I thought was a very interesting twist. It's a good twist on this on this story. Uh, and then he kicks his head off. But um, <laughs> and there's a line who he's like, he takes the little boy back and says, like, so I got to take you back so I can do that again in 61 years. But there's a moment that is in this and there's a moment in that has happened problematically several times in the issue. Uh, one of the main features of Midnighter is that he is homosexual mm-hmm. and he makes Paulus get down on his knees before he kicks his head off. Mm-hmm. And Paulus says, you're not you're not going to make mm-hmm. make. And Midnighter goes, boy, you have a filthy mind. Now, I think in every single issue of this series so far, and probably in every single issue in this entire collection, there is sort of some sort of derogatory LGBTQ mm-hmm. remark. Mm-hmm. It really stands out to me. Mm-hmm. What are your feelings on this? I'm a little conflicted about this because, um, to my knowledge, Garth Ennis is not an LGBTQIA. No, I'm pretty certain he's married. Person. I'm pretty certain he's a straight married man. Um, which again is not to say that straight people can't write queer characters and, mm-hmm. and vice versa. Um, you know, so on the on the one hand, I feel like there's a way that you can have this scene. I don't I don't even mind the fact that your villain is assuming that this is gonna be um, a, a sexual act and that Midnight is like really like come on, don't be gross about it. Uh, I just don't know if it's handled with the most sensitivity um, or, or as subtly as it could have been. I don't know, because I, I think I think there's a good idea in this scene. I just don't know if it's executed well. I agree. To me, it screams off as a mid-2000s, kind of like yes. when uh, I'm, you're, you're going to Listeners, you're going to wonder what I what try, kind of point I'm trying to make here. But when uh, Ashley and I rewatched the entirety of Frasier, the NBC sitcom starring yes. Kelsey Grammer, <laughs> yeah. uh, a couple years ago, we noticed that there were a lot, a lot of, oh, is Frasier gay jokes? There's a lot of bad homophobic 
borderline yeah. by modern standards, by contemporary standards, homophobic jokes that for the time would probably have been seen as very funny. Fine, yeah. But for now, you're yes. just like, ooh, this yes. is a little, oh, I don't know about this. Also for how many gay men there actually were on that show. <laughs> that's that's what these stand out to me. I would agree with that, yes. There's also not one issue that goes by where we don't address Midnighter's homosexuality, even though in this particular story, there's almost no reason for it to be addressed. No. Apollo's not present. He, No one's asking him, except for the scene with Bonnie where she's like, do you want to go have sex in the back of this he spaceship? Ain't, he, ain't, he ain't making love. He's making war in this book. There, truly. Um, and there are several stories later on where almost every single time it is brought up, and I know that it's an integral part of his identity. I know it's one of the most interesting things about his it's character. It's his defining character trait, sadly. Um, but he's also more than that, and just because a character is gay or is trans or is queer, it doesn't mean it it needs to be addressed as a punchline. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what this is. This is set up as a punchline, and I think that's why it feels a little gross. Yes. Um, yeah, it's problematic. But I will say, I do like the end of this story that he goes back to the ship, and we almost have a full circle where uh, he sees the authority again, and he's like, I'm not a lover, and he doesn't want to participate with any of their stuff, and yeah. he goes right back to the door world, and he opens a door to another war-torn country, back to kicking tanks and going and stuff like that, where he's just in this constant... His natural state of being is fighting, mm-hmm. which I really like. Now... Ashley, you've read more of the issues in this. I read them a long, long time ago. I read the whole ago. thing, yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about some of these other stories? Um, are are there more positive, more bad? Just mm-hmm. give us a loose overview of the rest of the stories. Right. Um, I will say, I wish there was more Apollo in this. Mm-hmm. It's called um, Midnighter. I know it is, but I am, I guess what I'm most interested in is, about Apollo, about Midnighter is his relationship to Apollo. Like I, I, yeah. I am interested in them as a balance of light and dark, in yin and yang. Um, you know, and it's it's nice to see characters who are hard and who are vicious be soft and be loving. The what now? Then there's a whole bunch of one shots after this. I think it's a poorly designed collection. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had to design collections before. I know when you have to hit a certain page count, sometimes you're doing all that you can do to fill that space. Well, you can tell they just wanted to collect the entire series. Absolutely. And there may have been, this may have been the publication order, but we we read a fully complete arc that's, I would say, pretty good. Like B plus A minus territory. I'd say B. And, um... And then we get like six one shots, most of which are not great. Uh, How, however, mm-hmm. the, there's there's a one shot that the one that immediately precipitates the story. It's an alternate reality telling of Apollo and Midnighter's love story as if they're two shoguns. Mm-hmm. I think it's fabulous. I think it's wonderful. I think it's gorgeous. I think it's beautiful. There's a story that comes a little bit later down the road where um, he is dared to help a girl save her cat. Okay, that's really really wonderful. I read that one. Um, most of them are just midnight or kicking ass and taking names, and yep. that's great. Which is the problem with a Batman analog. Abs- absolutely. But every once in a while, you get a story where they dig a little deeper, and it's much more interesting. There's a an arc that's five five issues where he goes back to his hometown and he kind of learns who he was before Midnighter because um, before he was Midnighter, he had a whole life and that was all wiped away from him. Um, he has a daughter, which no, no one explained to me. This girl just shows up and is like, hey, dad. And he's like, stop no, calling he, me dad. He, he has a daughter. Uh, uh, that's from the main authority series. Okay, him, but, him and Apollo have a daughter called uh, Jenny. It's Apollo's daughter? It's both of theirs. She, I, see, see, this girl mm-hmm. just shows up and it's like, dad, dad, dad. And mm-hmm. I like, I had no idea who this girl was or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, him reinvestigating that time in his life is really interesting. And um the town has been taken over by these people called bellwethers and they have American flags on their faces. It's sort of like a really interesting examination of um, Midwestern America at the time. I think it's more, it more subtly handles um, what it's like to be a blonde queer man who comes out of that part of the world. than I think this first arc does, but overall I really think this first story is the best, the best 100%. part. Well, this is the problem with um this is the problem with um you know uh wildstorm books in the past 
tended to be not very well planned out. A lot of image books suffer from this. And oh, I think a thousand percent. I think they sold the series on Garth Ennis and then Garth Ennis, uh, you know, left, left yeah. and didn't do anything. And then they couldn't get any of the other creators to stay on. And, and that's problem. That's problematic. So I would say that this is an OK collection. Let's go into the rating of this book, uh, GHL intern Brego the Cat has shown up. Uh, Brego, yes, what, actually. what are your thoughts on uh, Midnight, the complete collection? I mean, we all know that Brego is more of an Apollo stand than I mean, Jason is literally holding intern Brego up to the microphone. Here, let's see if he can get his thoughts. <laughs> He's he's got his little paw up on the microphone. He's pulling it towards him. That's a uh, okay. That's uh, those are his thoughts on uh, Midnighter. Wow. Yes, he's more of an Apollo cat. Yes, he for is. sure. Um, so Ashley, um, I'm gonna give my thoughts first. Yeah. On a scale of one to five, Bregos. I'm gonna give this actually, if it was only the first five to six issues, yeah, I would give this a four. But since it's not. And I think the majority of this collection is not great and very scattershot all over the place. I'm going to have to give this a three. Mm-hmm. I think this is a great collection to pick up, knowing that the first story is great with, the, you know, we didn't talk about that much. Chris Sprouse's art, love it. I will always liked his art. I will, I will definitely echo that. Chris Sprouse, and I think his art does a lot of the heavy lifting because there's 100%. not a lot of dialogue in this book. Uh, it depends. Some pages are very wordy, some pages aren't. But that whole first issue is basically just him fighting, tanks. fighting yeah, and yeah. some sound effects. Uh, yes. Uh, mad respect to Chris Sprouse. He should draw all the Midnighter things. <laughs> Anyways, um, so um, he... I don't know. The, the first storyline is really good. I'm going to give this a three. If you're interested in Midnighter, this is one of the only books you can pick up. But also, I think this is a decent. The, the first story is worth the entire price of the ticket. What are your thoughts? How many? So I'm giving it three out of five Bregos. I think three out of five Bregos for the whole collection is very fair. I agree with you. If it was just the first miniseries or the first arc and maybe two or three of the one shots by the way that's the everybody out there that's the reason why we're only talking about mainly the first arc because again after that it's like again it's a series it's a of mess. it's a one shot it's a mess it's yeah. a bunch of one shots and it's like the Keith uh, Giffen, we're not going to talk about every one of them the Keith Given arc is pretty good uh, actually there's but, one where there's a monkey in it yes uh, it's weird it's yeah. weird um, yeah if it were only if it was just that first arc I think I would give it a four because I think it's a big idea. I think it's a big swing and I think it's largely successful. Um, I think I think it's just how our sensibilities have evolved over time that we're knocking it now. But there's nothing in it that I think borders on offensive or, or, or truly problematic. I think if you are looking to get into Midnighter, I think this is a decent starting point. I think you should probably read the authority first. Uh, you should definitely to read the truly get a grasp on the character. Um but I think this is um, a, a better jumping on point, a better starting point for the character than the next, um, um, than the Rebirth series. Because the Midnight or Apollo Rebirth series is like very weird and mired by well, continuity. Sa- I, I, sad to say is that this Midnighter series is directly connected to the authority. It takes place right after the two, mm-hmm. the main, the, the, the first 25 issues of the authority. And after that, all the Midnighter and all the Apollo stuff is very disconnected. It's not, and and, Which that, is a bummer. and that's where it suffers. They they've kind of rebooted Midnighter and Apollo two or three times, and each time it's never been as good as this one. Yes, now, and this one's not perfect. Fun fact: Warren Ellis, the guy you keep confusing with Garth. I uh, always conf- <laughs> I, look. This is I've done this on Geek Coast. I always get them confused, yep. and because they have very similar sensibilities. Yep, and one is uh, English and one is Irish. Well, I've never met them, so uh, there. Garth is Irish. <laughs> um, they have just brought them back into the Wild Storm. Uh, which actually is quite enjoyable, and they haven't announced an authority team. But you're right; the original version of the authority and this Midnighter series is the best version. Um, yeah, so three out of five. I'll give it a three out of five. I will say I do think in our future there is a truly great, truly transcendent Midnighter and Apollo story. Okay, I do. I believe that. Uh, I would love to take a swing at it. You can hire me at any time. Speaking of transcendent stories, uh, Ashley, I think it's time to announce the next book that we will be reading for the book club and the date. Now, 
Uh, fun fact, everybody, uh, depending on schedules, the date for this can change. As the, as happened with this but episode. we should be giving you plenty of warning. Ashley, what is the book that we're going to be reading next? The next book we are going to be reading is going to be one of my all-time favorites and a past recommended reading of this show, Spider-Man Blue. Spider-Man Blue. Yep. Hoping we'll have a great guest for that, but uh, asterisks to be determined. Oh, yeah. We are working on trying to get a really cool guest for that one. Uh, Hopefully we can get that gentleman. Yes. And it is currently slotted for July 23rd Mm -hmm. when this episode goes up. Of course, we will have our post up on the website and on Patreon. So if you want to comment, no one commented on Midnight. Please comment on Spider-Man. We got to talk about that. Um we got to talk about that. Uh, so we do these posts on the patrons over Which, at patreon.com slash Jawins, J-A-W-I-I-N. Every and patron has access. To yeah, every patron, even the $1 patrons, go over there and support, and you get a lot of cool stuff. Um, fun fact, actually, I've been thinking about a, a new idea for a show that I might be adding to the patron, do, the Patreon. Uh, very do, do. cool show. Anyways, um... You all, you all have family marks. You do. Nobody left a comment. No, the only comments we got were very sweet, which were people being like, "I've ordered my book. Go read them. My book. We're gonna read them. We're gonna. Uh, well, you're gonna have to oh, give I'm me sorry. some time to find I, them because I didn't. Uh, I don't have them pulled up because no one right. said anything. Never mind, Ashley. Um, Never mind. Uh, I, I, I threw Ashley under the water and I was not prepared for that's that. Okay. I, I but, but as much as we love you keeping us up to date on your chipping, even if you don't like something, we've read some comments where people didn't like things yeah, in the totally. past. That's totally fine. We want these episodes to be more interactive, which is why we put up the posts and it's why we put up all the warnings. Look, that I, look, it's I, your I, time. So I, please, we want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, we want this to be a discussion between you guys and us. And um, what I hope is that just because this wasn't a book from the big two, mm-hmm. that this is the reason why nobody commented. Like, well, we look, had a lot of comments on Black, and we had some decent comments on Invincible. Well, because this is not a popular fair book. Fair. Um, I, you know, I, again, part of the idea of the book club is to expand your repertoire, mm-hmm. your 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 literacy. Your uh, your literacy is just fine, by the way. But to expand and to do different things, we don't oh, we don't always just want to talk about Superman and Batman, right? I mean, um, I think you can tell from the discussion this was my first major interaction with mm-hmm. this character, and if that's your case, leave a comment. Maybe you'll be wrong. It's fine. By the way, I actually do think you should read this volume. I think we said that several times. I do, too. At least the first five, six issues. By the way, it's on Hoopla. It's free. Yeah. (laughs) If you have Hoopla. I also think if you, especially for, since we're, we're, you know, Pride Month and and everything like that, if you're looking at the pantheon of queer superheroes. There aren't many. There aren't many. Midnighter is one of the most badass. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's not a lot of queer Male characters. Most of the queer characters are ladies. Queer and married. Yeah. And He's married. successfully married to and, and never been a divorced. Father. Yeah. And by the way, he's been around for about 20 years now. Jesus, can you believe that Midnighter is like actually someone we should be looking right? up to? Yeah. Um, but I just think I think through that lens, um, even though we've said that like Mid- Midnighter is sort of um a mixed bag in terms of the quality of storytelling. I think he's a really important character. I agree. Um, so I hope that I hope people do check this out. So and, everyone out there in the patron land over at patreon.com slash Jawin, at any level, when we put out Spider-Man Blue, I want on the Spider-Man Blue We're going to get so many club, because of Spider-Man. I <laughs> want to blow the doors off with our questions on Spider-Man. Ten Blue. comments. Ten comments. I want 25. 25 comments. <laughs> you know, I, I want there to be so many patron questions that our guest is like, oh, my God. Um, you guys are going to like this guest. I hope we haven't confirmed this guest yet. I really, I'm probably building it up too much. I don't care. Um, <laughs> so I guess who Jason and I are very uh, I'm excited about. I'm really excited to have, if we can get this guest mm-hmm. to come on and read Spider-Man Blue with us. I'm really, somebody who's never been on the podcast before. And I'm also going to say this, somebody who Ashley and I are podcast fans of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, no, it's not Kevin Smith. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, that's obviously the, for whatever, you know. Anyways, uh, but please leave us a comment over there. We, yeah. re- we really do want your discussion. Okay, uh, real quick, recommended reading, of course, for this episode is going to be the collection, in case you haven't picked it up. Yep. And also, I think, yeah, Ashley, you should put on Authority Volume 1 and Authority Volume 2, just in case everybody wants to get everything. I think that's a great suggestion. I will do that. Of the Midnight Thars. We. Oui. Okay, uh, the last section of the podcast is the 
GHL Honor Roll. That's where if you go over to Apple Podcasts and you leave us a five-star review, you can literally write anything you want, and we will read it on the podcast because you are helping us and you are giving us a perfect five stars. By the way, we have a backlog of these. We are chugging through them as fast as we can. We are literally in August um, of 2018 because you guys do crush it. You guys are going awesome. over we're, and we're, reviewing on Apple Podcasts. We will podcast. read these. I, I will make you this promise. If Geek Kinster Lesson ever cancels, I'm not saying it will, if we ever stop the podcast, we'll read them all. We will. Even, the last episode pro, will probably just be the a year's roll. worth of the A year's worth of the honor. <laughs> we will get through your comment. Yeah. Please keep reading your comments. We will get through them. I don't know. Maybe next episode, actually, we should read three to start chugging along. Maybe. It's also amazing where uh, when people come, they're like, you finally read them. I know. We I love them. that. I love, love that them. so we much. Love them. We love yeah. them. We love them. Uh, okay. So who's going to join the honor roll this week? We have two people joining the honor roll this week. The first is D Train 86, who says, my favorite podcast. Yes. Hello, Geek History Lesson. This podcast is by far one of my favorites. I get a huge smile on my face when I see a new episode hit my playlist. I've listened to all of them. Wow. And continue to look forward to more. Jason and Ashley are great hosts and keep the conversation light and funny. Thank you. I love learning more about each comic book character and has taken my nerd level to greater heights. I think you're missing attraction there, but that's They okay. might have written on you. their phone. It's okay. Yeah, Don't yeah. judge them. They gave us five stars. My favorite parts of the show are the discussion times and how publication history affects the character. I like to imagine myself at the table answering their discussion questions. Well, you're at the table that. right now. The Doctor Strange Welcome. Christmas special was also enjoyable. <laughs> Can't wait for this year's special. I hope you liked it. If you love comics and other nerd things like this... This is a must-listen podcast. West Coast Avengers. Dun, dun, dun. They actually put the little emojis in there, so I bet they did type this on their phone. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, D Train eighty six, and they are joined by Owen Dark, who says best comic podcast. Recently found this podcast and have instantly fallen in love. The two hosts are great and work well together and help and in their own thoughts on the topics they're covering. They definitely know what they're talking about and have definitely taught me some interesting facts. Still hoping to see a Connor Kent Superboy episode in the future, but no matter the topic, so I'm I. going to be tuning in. Well, you know what? We had one on the schedule and we moved it. We couldn't work it in. We couldn't. We, couldn't we work will it in. get a Connor Kent. Uh, he's we'll put of, it out there. We'll put it. Who, who's the commenter? I'm sorry. I forgot their name. This is Owen Dark. Owen Dark. We... We literally were planning to do a Superboy episode about a month ago. Yeah. And then we had some stuff come up and we couldn't. We I think couldn't, we, we moved it for a more relevant topic. I can put money on Superboy will probably happen by the end of 2019. And I will put money that I bet we're going to have a little super guest on yes, during we are that episode. A, we will have a super guest. We will have a super guest. We've already talked to the super guest about coming on for that episode, so I can guarantee you that we will probably wait to record it until we can work the super guest into the podcast, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. So whatever that is, we don't know. Uh, freelancing is hard. Uh, Ashley, who are our two people that join the honor roll again? So we have D Train 86 and Owen Dark joining us in the Teacher's Lounge today. Owen Dark and D Train 86, welcome to the Teacher's Lounge. There are oranges in the corner, and there is a gold cat in. The, oh wait, it's just Brago. That's Brago in the corner. He snuck into the teacher's lounge too. Oh, you can go over there and give some, uh, Brago some scratches. What does Professor Brago teach? Professor Brago <laughs> teaches advanced. 31st century calculus. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Much smarter than I gave he's him credit a, for. He's a smarty, smarty cat. Uh, so if you want to join the GHO Honor Roll and be welcomed into the Mind University Teacher's Lounge, you need to go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Again, you can write anything because you help us in the search algorithms. You help us in the ratings. We will read your thing on the podcast. I think next week we're going to start doing three. And um, Ashley... Uh, where can they suggest future lessons and also future book club ideas? You can suggest future lessons at geekhistorylesson.com, facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson, or on Twitter at GHL Podcast. And you can suggest future book club topics. Uh, we've actually have a bunch of them that people have recommended in the past cool. that we go through so that's very very exciting and everything here is malleable so the timeline changes yes you can follow me on twitter and instagram at jawin j-a-w-i-i-n don't forget my book super soldiers is all about military comic superheroes and my personal military career it's on amazon and barnes and noble and your local bookstore right now if you've already bought it Please leave a review on Amazon. It makes a difference. Just like iTunes reviews. Please. Helps out a lot. And you can follow Ashley on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley V. 
Robinson. Ashley uh, has a super cool. She just she's sending out rewards right now for Aurora and the Eagle. That's she's, true. She's doing that stuff, so that's pretty cool. You should be getting that in your mailbox if you supported that very soon. Hashtag stick around. It's the last part of the podcast. In case you've never listened to this podcast before, in case you've never stuck through the plugs, we make sure that you do. We talk some more. Uh, Ashley, I want to ask you this question. Mm-hmm. Hashtag stick around. Also, let us know on Twitter if you like hashtag stick around using the I hashtag think, stick around. I think people do. Okay, I hope so. You think we get to people all the way through? I do. All right. Because people comment on it a lot. Do they? <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see what they do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell a story right now. Okay. Um, I bought the new 52 Stormwatch only because it was basically the new 52's version of the authority mm-hmm. with Midnight in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not very good. Sadly. Okay. Uh, but they give Midnighter a chin spike. And, oh, yeah. And it's so, yeah, dumb. Yeah. it's so dumb looking. It's very, very dumb. I looking. like the weird three um, things he has on the top of his head. Because in a silhouette, it looks like Batman. What? He kind of has on the top of his cowl, there's like three like spines almost. They're like a little elevated. They're oh, like sort little of. Pointy but it's, yeah, he basically wears a mask that's not bad with that. Anyways, not my question. Um, <laughs> uh, I I want you to know if you if you enjoyed this hashtag stick around. Uh, um, I want I want to see a hashtag Stormwatch fifty two. Tell me what you thought about it. Um, Ashley, do you think we'll ever see an authority or Midnighter in live action anywhere? Do you think we'll ever see these characters in live action? No. I would like to. Interesting. I think the only chance we have is if I thought the DC Universe app was going to exist for longer than maybe four more months. Okay. Um, I think... I just think it's too weird, man. Do you know... I think it's too... I think it's like Doom Patrol. You know, Midnighter is the perfect character to introduce into the Arrowverse. Yeah, to do Batman up. Can I tell you? Yes. Can I tell you? And I've been saying that actually for years in our Arrow reviews. I've been like, Mm -hmm. where's Midnighter? So... I anticipated this question because we do a lot of like, would you want them in live action? Do you want a casting? Can well, I tell well, you? Well, maybe, maybe I should guess I shouldn't ask. I don't okay. know. No, no, no. <laughs> Can I tell you who I would cast as Midnighter and Apollo? All right. This who, better be good. We'll never get ben, them. Ben Affleck and Matt Damon? No. Ben Affleck and Henry Cavill. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll never get them. <laughs> I don't think Henry Cavill works as an Apollo. I don't think he does aesthetically. I would also want, because they always draw Apollo with white or gray hair. Uh, yes. I would want. Sometimes gold. I would want him to be like an attractive older man. Mm-hmm. Um, like a Matthew McConaughey? Well, I don't think Matthew McConaughey is attractive. All right, all right, all right. I don't. He's not good looking. Fight me do- on Twitter. What are you, what are <laughs> He's you doing a over here, Ben Nida? He's a fabulous actor. Um, but no. I keep getting older and he keeps staying the same <laughs> age. <laughs> That's awful. But because, Actually, Apollo is the one that doesn't age. Yes, but because he was super banned, so. Interesting. Um, that's sad because like. And I wonder if it's some sort of weird rights thing because they are Wildstorm characters. But then doesn't that just mean Jim owns them? Well, or Jim hasn't signed off on them, maybe. Uh There's got to be a reason. Because actually, to be honest with you, I'm very surprised we haven't seen any Wildstorm character in any Mm -hmm. of the Arrowverse. I agree. The closest we've gotten is we've seen Grifter... He is in the Flashpoint animated series. Yes. Um, but I'm actually just surprised that we haven't seen a revival or, a re- again, Authority. But the bad sign is that Warner Brothers would have to make it. Authority is, like, perfectly made for a movie, especially now. Because Authority almost makes fun of the superhero genre and blows it up. Literally. Can I pitch you something? Sure. Uh, Warner Brothers just closed a very expensive deal with Bad Robot. Would you want to see a J.J. Abrams Authority no. project? No, not at all. But you love Mission Impossible. I mean, J.J. Abrams only directed one Mission Impossible movie, so yeah. and not the best one, in my opinion, That's anymore. Fair. Um, no, J.J. Uh, Abrams is not the golden boy. J.J. Abrams' style also does not work for the Authority. The pers- I don't. I didn't think so either. The, but. The, the person who would who would best direct the Authority movie is somebody who's already directed uh, material from the same from a writer who's already worked in the Authority and Authority, and that <laughs> that's Matthew Vaughn. Mm. Matthew Vaughn would 
knock an authority movie out of the park because Matthew Vaughn. You wouldn't want someone with a darker sensibility. Matthew Vaughn has have a dark sensibility. I don't know if you've seen his movies here, girl. I mean, X Men First Class, Um, not really dark. uh, But Layer Cake is supremely dark. Kick Ass is extremely dark. Kingsman is dark for a Kingsman movie. Yeah, I mean, no, I didn't see. Um, They all have attitude, and that's what the authority is. The authority is not dark. Authority is full of attitude. I guess my brain was like David Cronenberg. (laughs) No, David Cronenberg. You, you, you need I would almost even say maybe a Tim Miller because he did Deadpool mm-hmm. like you need somebody who is not going to be precious that's who does the authority mm. um, or or a Midnighter movie but uh, yeah I don't know man a Midnight yeah again Midnighter would work so well I mean, in the if, Arrowverse if Batwoman wants a free idea and Batwoman wants two queer leads yeah, Midnighter would be great in Batwoman and then you don't have to worry about Batman yeah which uh, is sort of the, uh, the sort of Damocles over that series they would be, also be the Batman? perfect characters to show up as alternate universe Batman and Superman sure. in the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover yeah and I'll say this I mean Midnighter is a is a white guy in the books he doesn't have to be white no you cast anyone as Midnighter uh, actually fun fact in the Wild Storm, which is Warren Ellis' reboot of the universe that Warren Ellis built, uh-huh. um, I just think it's very funny. Yes. They were like, huh, Warren Ellis wrote all these titles and basically built this universe from scratch. Who should we get to reboot it? How about Warren Ellis? <laughs> How about literally anyone else? No, Warren Ellis. <laughs> um, That's really funny. Uh, he I've ra- never thought about that. Uh, he race bent them. Great. Uh, uh, Apollo. No, no. Midnighter, I think, is now Hispanic. Great. And then he's definitely a white blonde guy in this, um, in this miniseries. I think they race bent Apollo as well. I think he race bent both of them. Uh, which I mean, I if thought he's was called really Apollo, you might as well at least make him Greek. I think I can't. I want to say he made Apollo Indian. I could be wrong oh, about that's that. That's cool. Um, and then when he lights up, he turns like completely white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now uh, I could be remember that wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, he race bent. Uh, yeah, neither one of them have to be. Yeah, the races they are. They could literally be. Any race. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter. Most superheroes, I think, that thing about. I agree. You know, I know some people get precious, but to be honest with you, uh, I'd be totally fine with an Idris Elba Batman. Let's go. Great. Yeah. I'd be totally fine with Idris Elba basically playing any part. Let's yeah, go. I mean. I John Luke Picard, let's go. I would have said for a long time. <laughs> I'd be like, but Wally West has to have red hair. But I mean, nope. the Flash TV show proved me wrong. No, it doesn't matter. As long as the intentions of the character yeah. are the same, it doesn't matter what I agree. they look like. I agree a thousand percent. Yeah. All right, that's it. Midnighter. Yeah. Hashtag stick around. Thank you so much for listening to this weird episode <laughs> of the Geek Hedge Lesson Book Club. Uh, fun fact, we recorded this pretty late. I so, think you can... Uh, I think... I think you can tell on which episodes we record late at night. Look, uh, <laughs> Jason's got a full-time job now, and uh, late night podcast recorded is the only time I got, baby. No, it's fine. All right. So, uh, this has been... Geek Hedge Lesson, I already said that before. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Um, over in the corner is GHL intern Brago the Cat. Brago, say goodbye. I am Jason uh, Nooner Inman. Keep, keep your mind on the gutter. <laughs> I am Ashley Victoria Robinson and Professor Jason, since you brought Midnighter into our lives, why don't you take this lesson out? Class is dismissed.